I'm hoping that uh, we get deep into this chapter. There's a, a pretty solid example that we're going to be going through here very soon, which will be example 2.3. And that's the one you really want to pay attention to. We'll hit some conceptual stuff today on some binding energy stuff, which I think is uh, really interesting. And there's a lot of misconceptions. The wording on the word binding energy is real bad. And you'll hear people sort of like talk about it in some language, which I surely do not like the way it's used, but you know, it is the way it is. I can't do anything about language. So we were looking at example 2.2. So let's go through it again. It says that you have a lambda particle is a subatomic particle that decays into a proton and a pion such that it's a lambda going to a proton plus a pi here. So this lambda is actually a neutral lambda. And this decay is a very important decay very early on in the study of particle physics because it actually showed for the first time what was considered a weak nuclear decay. And I think it got, it was predicted and it wasn't observed. I think it was predicted in the 19, like 45, 1950 or something like that. And it wasn't observed till the 1960s, but they knew it was there, it was supposed to be there. And so in this experiment, what you're finding here is that they give you the outgoing momentums of the proton and the pion. And they give you values of the momentum of the uh, proton at 581 MeV and the momentum of the pion, which is 140 MeV. And then there's the masses of these two particles. So again, as before, I need you to really understand collisions. And this is a very broad word for a collision. And what we really mean by a collision when we're dealing with particles is that, that if I look at a system, I have a lambda and this lambda is isolated. Okay, it's isolated. And because it's isolated, that means that the external force on the system is zero. And so what this means here, if this is what happens before, then afterwards, what that tells you is then momentum is still conserved. That's what I mean by a collision. Even though it doesn't look like a collision, all we know is that afterwards, the system which has these two particles in it still have an external force equal to zero. So this immediately implies here that the initial momentum and the final momentum are the same. And typically when you have a scenario like this, this is what we call a collision. And there's many different types of collisions. Okay, even though the lambda will cease to exist, it actually shows up as, um, as a particle that has all the, the same details of it retaining. So now what we wanna do here is that in the previous example, if you remember, we were talking about the uh, you know, ex accelerating gold nuclei and its nucleons and we were dealing with the single particle. We are not dealing with the single particle anymore. We are dealing with the system. So if I deal with the system, I gotta talk about energy and momentum of the system. But the question is very specific. It says, find the rest energy of the lambda particle. So when I look at this energy of the system, the details of the lambda require us to write down the four energy of the lambda because that, that, that's what describes the details of the lambda. Remember, this is a single characteristic. This is a system characteristic equation. So if we wanna calculate this rest energy right here, right? Here's where the rest energy is at. 
that implies that we got to go in and we got to do what? We got to get the momentum of the lambda and we got to go get the energy of the lambda. How do I get the momentum of the lambda? I use conservation of momentum. How do I get the um, energy of the lambda? I use conservation of energy to get it. So once I have those, then I could go in and write down the rest energy of that system. So here we go. So the first thing I want to do is says sketch a picture of the collision, which particle is moving faster after the lambda. And then we'll check that in a little bit here. So what you'll see here is that if I have a lambda, it's moving in a beam pipe. So as it's moving in a beam pipe, it comes in and then it suddenly disappears. It literally just vaporizes into thin air, as we would say. And you know, just the, the physics of decays is so fascinating. How could something just kind of go boof and it's gone, right? That sounds like fiction or something. It's not fiction. This shit is for real. It's not like that, that fantasy book type shit, right? This is real stuff here. And then afterwards, you just have a proton and a pion moving. So because these momentums are in the same direction as the lambda, as the particle says, then using conservation of momentum, I could literally come in here and say, well, I know that the lambda is moving forward. So the center of mass of the system must continue to move forward after the decay. So that means I'm going to distribute the momentum of the lambda into the proton and the pion. And so it must be this guy right here. So if I want to determine the rest mass of the lambda, then as I said before, it's an individual question. And so that means here, I need to go in and look at the four energy to get that. However, conservation laws tells us about the system. So I got to apply both of these. So the easiest one to solve for would be the momentum of the lambda because we already have the momentum of the proton and the pion. So using conservation of momentum, I write this out. I now have the momentum of the pion. So the last thing I need to do here is that I need to go get the energy of the lambda. So now the second thing that I want to get here is that we, so now we want to solve for E of the lambda using conservation of energy. So that's where we're after right now. So here we go. Well, conservation of energy tells us this here. It tells us that the total energy of the system must be the energy of the proton plus the energy of the pion. But I can get the energy of the proton and I can get the energy of the pion because I know their momentums and I know their rest energies. So what I can do then is that I could then use the four energy to get these energies. And that means EP and E pi. So if I look at the four energy, I could see here that the energy of the proton must be the kinetic energy of the proton plus its rest energy. So what we know here is that it's already been given here, up here, that the momentum is 581 MeV. And I also know that the, um, that the rest mass of the proton is 938 MeV, which is given in the problem. And so if I look at this thing here, then that means here that if I want the energy of the proton, then I could come in here and I can just square this guy. So I'm, then I'm gonna get the square root of this guy here, which will be 581 squared plus 938 squared 
and this will be in units of MeV, I'm going to get a value of 1103 MeV. And this will tell me the energy of the proton. Again, the details of the particle require us to use the four energy. So now let's go look at the pion. So if I do the exact same thing for the pion, what's the big difference here? The mass of the pion here is 140 MeV. Maybe I should write C squared. And then of course the momentum of the pion, which is already given up above here is also 140 MeV. This tells me then that the energy of the pion when you go and you calculate it is 292 MeV. So now I have the energies of both decay products. So then I could go calculate the, uh, the energy of the lambda then. So the energy E lambda then is gonna be what? Well, E lambda from conservation of energy tells me it must be a combination of these guys right here. So if I start to plug my stuff in here, then I'm gonna get 1103 plus 292, and I'm gonna get a value of 1395 MeV, and then I'm gonna round that to 1400 MeV, which will then be the energy of this lambda. So I now have the energy. Up here, I calculated the momentum of the lambda. So now I'm gonna use the four energy to actually do that. But, you know, but before we go on here, I asked the question, which particle is moving faster? So I had a question earlier. Which particle is moving faster? The is beta of the proton versus beta of the pion, right? We need to compare those two. Well, I'll tell you what my guess is. My guess is that the proton being a much larger mass should be moving at a slower speed after the decay. That would have been my guess. So let's go look at that. So I would say this is my guess here because mass of proton, you know, I don't want to say is much bigger, but it's definitely bigger than the pion. It's probably by a, it's a factor of three, right? Is that a factor of three? Actually, it's a factor of six. So when you look at the mass of the, uh, proton, it's about six times the mass of the pion. So I would think that the, that the proton would be moving slower. So let's go look at this thing. So what do I do? Well, I got to go calculate the beta of the proton, which then says the momentum of the proton plus the energy of the proton. And if we look at these values, this is going to be 581 MeV divided by 1103 MeV, which then gives you a value of 0 0.527. And then if I do the exact same thing for the pion, and I plug in my values here, I'm gonna have 140 over 292, and this value is 0 0.480. And so what you're seeing here that, 
since beta of the proton is greater than beta of the pion, which therefore tells me that the proton is moving faster after the decay, which surprises me a little bit. I would have expected the bigger mass, but that's not what the calculation says, so we just leave it there. Okay, so now we have that. So now let's go in and let's start uh, looking at the um, rest mass. So now we need to, we want to calculate the rest mass of the lambda naught particle. So this is a particle thing, not a system thing. We're asking a very specific particle thing. So then using the four energy, this tells me here that the rest mass of this guy here is then going to be the square root of this guy. So if I punch in my numbers, I'm going to get 1395 squared, and then I'm going to get um, minus 70, 721 MeV squared. And I'm seeing here that this is going to give me then 1194 MeV. So the rest mass or the rest energy of this lambda particle is in 1194 or roughly 1200 MeVs here. Okay, so there's the rest mass. Sir, um, um, I said, um, 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 I still don't get like how come the the the, the um the um s s s smaller particle because I thought that you don't actually care about the the whole s s size of that thing you care about or is it more about the well I think I well the situation is more complicated it's not just about phase space as we say when I use the word phase space it's how much momentum space, how much energy space is available. Uh -huh. And in this situation, it just turns out that these guys are moving relatively slow oh. compared to the lambda, that most of it actually stays with the uh, sort of like the mass potential of the system. Okay. And so ultimately, I mean, there's an example that I use in physics 4A about the momentum of a bowling ball versus the momentum of a golf ball. Yeah, yeah. In this case, most of the momentum stays with the bowling ball. Yeah. And so therefore, it just it's just does that. But the speed says that it's actually faster. So okay. But I mean, it's I can't really tell you the details about that because you have to come in and you have to look at more at more stuff here. So let's look at the next example, 2.3. It says that the positive pion decays from rest into a muon and a neutrino. And they tell you what the masses are of the muon, the pion, and the neutrino here. And then it says, get a picture of the collision. And then using the given values, is the muon relativistic or non-relativistic? And then, use conservation of energy and momentum to determine the speed of the muon. Okay, we have to use conservation of energy and momentum. Why? I have a system now. There's no choice. It's not an individual particle. The system determines what's going on here. So, so let's talk about this. So we've already talked about the pion. So what I wanna do here is that I wanna interpret 
the particles. And so we have, the first particle that we have is that we have a pion, which in this case is a positively charged pion. And this type of particle is called a meson. A mesons are two quark particles. And mesons are, there's a lot more involved here, but they're essentially a combination. So if I look at a pion, it's actually an up and a down quark combination. Now, the other one that I really want to talk about, because we've talked about the muon, and I feel like I should talk to you a little bit more about the muon, just so that you know what we're talking about. The muon, which is a negatively charged, is a heavy electron. And what I mean when it's a heavy electron, it has all the same properties of a regular electron. It really, really does here. And the big difference here is that electrons, so if I think about an electron, if I was to give you an analogy, I imagine a little car. It doesn't have a lot of mass, right? And you're still driving your cheesy gold car here. And so when you're driving this car here, what you're finding here is that this guy is moving, let's say at some V, and if you actually try to stop the momentum of this guy here, you wouldn't need a big pile of hay. So this is a small pile of hay to stop the small car. On the other hand, the muon is a completely different animal as far as mass is concerned. We're talking, this thing is like a huge Mack truck. Okay, a huge Mack truck. So when this guy's plowing through stuff here, even though this might be moving the same speed, it has huge momentum. And so when you look at this guy, you could ima imagine that if this thing is really massive, then you need a large pile of hay to stop. So it, had, it would just plow through so much. So the reason why the muon and the electron are so different is because of their masses here. And what you find here is that the mass of the muon is about 200 times the mass of the electron. And so typically what you find here is that the way you look at these things here is that you have a particle that's coming in. So let's imagine this is the muon coming in. And what you find here is like, let's say that you have some type of interaction point. And these muons, so the way you detect particles in uh, detectors here is that you have these things called calorimeters. And these calorimeters, let's say that this is a calorimeter, and this is for electrical stuff. And then there's another one, and this guy is typically thicker, and this guy's for the hadrons. And hadrons would be like protons, neutrons, etc. And then you have a series of uh, chambers now. 
not sure what just happened, but you have a series of chambers. And these series of chambers are, are uh, their whole goal here, in essence, they're called the, oops, they're called the muon chambers. And so if you had an electron, an electron would come in and it would stop right here. So electrons stop here. And then if you had a proton and a neutron, it would stop here with this uh, hadron. By the way, I didn't write this, but maybe I should here. This is what they call calorimeters. And when you look at these calorimeters here, what they do here is that they measure energy deposits. So what happens to that muon? That muon literally will get stopped right here. So the muons stop here. And they go through a whole lot more stuff. One, because its mass is so big, and two, it interacts less with other particles because its mass is so big. We say that that's sort of like the phase here. So, you know, just as an aside here, muons are really, really interesting. If muons did not rain on us from outer space, there would be no lightning storms. You would not likely see lightning in your lifetime if it wasn't for the muons, which I think is kind of cool when you think about that. So that's the muon. The other particle, oh my gosh, the neutrino. I would say that this little particle here, the neutrino, it's probably, is, so it's, it, it's almost massless, right? That's kind of a funny word. For years, people thought that it had no mass. It wasn't until there was an experiment called uh, Keck, which has occurred in, in uh, Japan, where they actually measured the mass of the neutrino. And the neutrino is probably responsible for me actually going into particle physics. And it was in, I think, the early 70s when I read a Scientific American, which, by the way, was way over my head. I had no idea what the article was saying. But they posed a question that I thought was super, super interesting. The question is this. How do you know that the sun is not dead? And what I mean by this, imagine that you take a red hot poker, okay? You take a red hot poker, and when you look at the red hot poker, you, you have it in the fire, right? You pull it out, you have a glove so it doesn't burn your hands, and you're sort of like holding it up in the air. What happens to that red hot poker over time? It's gonna cool down, and then it's sort of gonna dim, and eventually all the heat goes out. How do you know that the sun is not the same way? And the answer is we know because inside the sun, it releases neutrinos and they literally shoot out into space. And so, what happens here is that neutrinos 
are the only way to see inside the sun. Carlos, do you mean to share your screen or no? Oh, I'm not sharing my screen? Mira vato. Yeah. Man, you want everything, Manuel, man. So the neutrinos are the only way to see inside the sun. You can't see inside the sun at all. And, you know, it's, it's kind of wild when you think about this here, because let me show you what I mean by that. Imagine that this is the sun, right? So we imagine that this is the sun here. And inside the sun, in the core of the sun, let's say that that's the core. In the core, what you find here, uh, in the core, there are proton, proton fusions. God damn it, how do you spell fusions? I, don't, I, I really don't care, okay. There are proton-proton fusions. And what you do here is that you literally take a proton and a proton, and then what you do here is that you fuse these two together. And when you fuse these things together, you get what's called a deuteron. And a deuteron is a neutron plus a proton. So it's an isotope of hydrogen. And what you find here, okay, Oh man, I'm, I don't know if I'm spelling this right either, but again, I really don't care. So what you find here is that the deuteron then decays into two particles. It decays into an electron and it decays into a neutrino, okay? And what you find here is that this neutrino shoots out of the sun within two seconds. So from the core to the surface of the sun, it's less than two seconds. I think actually, I think it's even shorter than that. I think it takes about two and a half seconds to go from the sun to the earth. So I think I'm wrong. So I got to change that. So it shoots out of the sun within a fraction of a second. Uh, we got a problem here. Why is that? Um, are you, is this maybe from its reference frame? Is that what you're saying? Because that's faster than the speed from, of light. You, is it? Yes. It takes eight minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. Okay. So how far, how long does it take from light unhindered to go from the, by the way, the reference frame, of course, has to be the earth because we measure it. Right. So this is all relative to the earth. Right. So, so I, I should be careful when I say a fraction of a second because neutrinos are massless, roughly. So they're gonna take however time it takes light to go from, you're right, it's eight minutes. So it's gotta be eight minutes to get to the earth. So the question is that how fast does it take light to go from the center of the sun to the surface of the sun? I'm assuming that that distance is not the distance to the earth. So I'm assuming that it's gonna be, let's say it's seconds. Okay, so let me be careful. So let's say that it shoots out of the sun. Oh, that's probably what I'm thinking in about 2.5 seconds. You see, Jason, dude, this is from memory. So we have to Google that shit, man, to get the details. But it's somewhere, it's of the order of seconds. So wh why is that even a big deal? If I have a light particle, a photon, that's created in the sun at the core, that light is then gonna come out here and it takes this really crazy path and then it shoots out. That light, so this photon, 
takes between 10,000 to 100,000 years to leave the surface of the sun. So these neutrinos are literally the only way you can look at that. I mean, which is, you know, pretty amazing. And there's three types of neutrinos. They're like the chameleons. They could change into different types of neutrinos. And, you know, if, if that, you know, that probably doesn't mean anything to you, but here's the, another thing that's really interesting about neutrinos. Most of the energy of the energy dissipated in supernovas is through neutrino emission. And again, we have to Google this shit, right? But if I remember correctly, if my memory is right, I think it's 99% of all of the energy of a supernova is in neutrino emission, which is pretty shocking. So do I think the neutrino is a super cool particle? Absolutely, man. That, I mean, I think understanding the role that the neutrino played in what's called the solar, solar neutrino problem, which then led to, so if you want to read about this, it's the solar neutrino problem, which then led to neutrino oscillations, which then led to a Nobel Prize. Like super, super interesting stuff. I think it's, yeah, it's, it, it totally moved me in that direction of why we want to come. You know, I've, I didn't mean to talk that much. We should have just done the goddamn problem. Let's do the problem. So what we want to do here is that we have a part of a, 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 a system here. So we have the pion and we have the neutrino plus, excuse me, the muon plus its neutrino. So what you're finding here is that because this is a plus right here, this is actually the anti muon, which is antimatter. That's what that plus sign indicates here. So what they're asking here is that they want you to sketch a picture of this thing. So here I go. So the first thing that I want to do here is that it says, I have a pion that decays from rest. So if I have a pion that decays from rest, then that means here, so picture-wise, I imagine, here's my pion. And what that tells me here is that its momentum is zero. And what you're seeing here is that because there is no external forces acting in the system, momentum must be conserved. So when I look afterwards, then afterwards, what we're seeing here is that I now have a muon and I have a neutrino that are shooting away. Well, the only way I can serve momentum, right, because this whole system here still has no external forces acting on it. So this and this have no external forces. So the momentum must be fixed here. So the only way this could be true here is that if I look at the momentum of the muon, let's say it's moving in the rightward direction, then that means here that the momentum of the neutrino must be in the opposite direction. That's the only way. So that means here, so if I now look at the collision carefully, I start off with the pion, 
This is what it is before. Then like Houdini, it disappears. And according to the way I set this up here, that means I now have a muon going in this doorway, and I now have a neutrino going that direction afterwards. So when I look at conservation of momentum, it tells me here that, that the momentum of the pion is zero, and therefore the only way this could be true here is that the momentum of the muon, which I'm gonna define in the positive direction, must be the opposite of the neutrino, which then tells us here that these guys must be what? Equal and opposite in momentum. So by conservation of momentum, these guys must have the same magnitude. So that's what I'm really getting from this collision here. So then what I want to do here is that, so now I want to kind of look at this thing here, okay? So what this is telling me here, so I've sort of like looked at the picture and momentum wise, so what does the energy space look like? So when I say the energy space, what is the available energy or mass energy that's available here? So in physics, what we do here is that we call it phase space. And that's called the kinematic phase space. And what you wanna do here is that to do this, we start by looking at the rest mass energies. So when I look at the rest mass energy, the first thing that I want you to look at is that, let's look at the mass of the pion. We just talked about the mass of the pion here, and it was 140 MeV. Now, if I look at the mass of the, uh, of the muon, it's 106 MeV. And then the mass of the neutrino, we'll say that it's zero because there's, it's sig figs won't allow us to look at that thing. So you could see here that um, the available um, energy must be what? 140 minus 106 which then tells you that it should be about 34 MeVs, right? So that's the available energy. So where is most of the energy in the system? We can see here that most of it must be right here. So most of the energy Um, of the pion goes into making a muon. So when I think about the picture of this thing and I draw a bar diagram, then I'm going to think about, well, what do I know about the pion? Well, the pion let's say has this amount of energy available and I can't have more energy than this, right? Conservation of energy focuses and tells me that I have this amount of energy. So since most of the energy goes into the muon, then I could come in here and I could say, well, maybe most of this energy is the energy of the muon and maybe a little bit of this is the energy of the neutrino here. So then I'm gonna ask the question, but what about the muon? We see that according to conservation of momentum, the muon 
and the uh, neutrino are going to be going back to back, as we say. So when I look at this thing, then what I'm going to do here is look what I'm going to do. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to focus only on the muon. If I focus only on the muon, so remember, we focus on muon only here. What I'm expecting then is that of this energy, most of this energy here has to be what? Has to be in the rest mass of the neutrino, oh, excuse me, the muon. The rest of this energy has to be what? It has to be in the kinetic energy of the muon where this guy here is the kinetic energy of muon. So what do I expect? So energy wise, so what do I expect about the muon? Is it relativistic? or non-relativistic. So when I look at this thing, what I'm seeing here is that I know that the energy of the muon must be this guy. So if it was relativistic, what would happen? I would ignore that P squared C squared term. But Looking at this picture here, I'm going to say that I'm going to have a little bit. And so therefore, this tells me here. So remember, if PC is much, much greater than MUC squared, then we say it's relativistic. But from our picture, it's not relativistic. I can't ignore the rest mass of the system. So what we're expecting here is that we expect it to be non-relativistic. Oh, damn. That's what we expect. Just by the energy, rest energy of the system, it should be non-relativistic. So now that we've, I, I think the question originally was what? Sketch a picture of the collision, and then tell me what you think about the muon. Is it going to be relativistic or non-relativistic? So that means it's the kinetic energy. We cannot ignore the rest energy of the system. So now, here we go. So now B. So here's where we get a lot of calculations now. There's a lot of algebra involved. Okay, let's go do it. So what we want to do here is that... Uh, so our goal here to determine the speed of the muon. So that means when I look at the speed of the muon, I got to look at this and I got to look at that. So you could see that I have two terms that I got to calculate. So that means here, if I want this guy, because I'm dealing with the system, what do I gotta do? I gotta use conservation of momentum. Okay, I gotta use conservation of momentum. And we've already have made the statement that we know that the magnitude of these guys are the same, okay? We already know that. And the other thing here is that if we want the energy of the muon, we have to use energy conservation. So here we use conservation of energy and from conservation of energy to determine, I'm sorry, 
And what we really mean by that statement is that we need E pi equals E muon plus E neutrino. Okay. So I got to use these two terms. However, there's some simplifications that we can use here, right? So we know a couple of things. To simplify calculations. So the first thing that we want to know here is that we know that the pion is at rest. So this implies here that the energy of the pion which is written like this here this guy's already zero. So that implies here that I can replace the energy of the pion with m pi c squared. That's, that's going to help because we don't have to deal with the momentum of the pion here because we know that this guy is zero. Okay? The other thing here is that we know that the neutrino is massless. So that means that when I look at the neutrino, it's going to be what? But we know that this guy here is zero, or it's approximately zero. So that means then that the energy of the neutrino is its kinetic energy. But wait a minute. We just said up here that the momentum of the neutrino is also the momentum of the muon. So then I can also write this here too. I can replace the energy of the neutrino with the momentum of the muon times C. So that's going to be really helpful as well here. And then we already see here that the muon is non-relativistic, which then implies that the energy of the muon, we have no choice but to write out the whole thing. Okay, so, so those are the three things that we got to talk about. Okay, so here we go. So. We've already dealt with conservation of energy, excuse me, conservation of momentum. So now what we need to do here is that we know we essentially got to come up here and we got to solve for the momentum of the muon and the energy of the muon. So now we must solve for P mu and emu, okay? So here we go. So what we do here is that we now look at uh, conservation of energy. So conservation of energy implies what? It implies here that the pi on has to be the energy of the muon plus the energy of the neutrino. Now, what you're going to find here is that if I clean this up a little bit, this really tells me that I have m pi c squared. Look at the muon here. The, the muon tells me that this is going to be p muon squared. That's a square root. And then remember then the, the energy of the neutrino is the same as the energy you know, the momentum of the muon times C. So I can write this as P mu C here. So when you look at this relationship, look what you're seeing here. I need to solve for P mu. And once I get P mu, I can then go get 
emu. Okay, so once I get the momentum of this thing, I then can go get the energy and then I can go get the speed. So the whole goal now is I gotta go solve for P mu here. And look at this thing, look at the square root. The way you deal with the square root is you isolate the square root on one side. So then what we wanna do here is that we want to isolate the square root term on one side. So if you do that, look what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write P mu squared, C squared, plus M mu squared, C to the fourth, square root. And then I'm gonna bring this to the other side and I'm gonna have this guy right here. So the first thing that I'm gonna do now is that I'm gonna square both sides. So I now squared both sides and look what I'm gonna get. On this side, I'm gonna have P mu C squared. And then I gotta square this term right here. And if I square this, I'm gonna get M pi squared C to the fourth. Then I'm gonna get P mu squared C squared. And then I'm gonna get the uh, interaction term between the two terms, which will give me 2 m pi c squared times p mu c. Now the beauty of this type of calculation is look what happens. What you're seeing here is look at this term. Look at this term. What are they gonna do? They're gonna cancel <laughs> each other out because they're both on the same side. Oh. So now what you're seeing here is that you're now left with what? a single p, p nu term. So solve for it. So um, you, you try to um, um, uh, square that to remove the whole um, uh, um, um, square root. And then you- You wanna isolate the square root term on one side. Okay, gotcha. And by the way, you have several homework problems with this type of thing. Oh, great. <laughs> and some of them, nice. the masses are not zero. So the algebra gets real ugly. So of course I picked the easier problem to do in lecture. No, actually that's not, that's only partly true. There is one or two problems that are more challenging as you'll find out. So now I'm gonna now isolate God damn it, how do you spell isolate? Isolate uh, P mu C here. So if you do that, look what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this to this side, and then I'm gonna take that to that side. So then I'm gonna get two M pi C squared times P mu C, and this will then be M pi squared C to the fourth minus M mu squared C to the fourth. Then I'm gonna keep dividing and you're gonna see that I'm gonna get a term that reads m pi squared minus m mu squared. Now note, when you look at this thing here, I have a c squared here, so it's gonna cancel two of the c's. So then I'm gonna get two, two, let me clear that, m pi, C squared. Now I have the momentum of the particle. I have the momentum of the muon. And remember, this is also the momentum of the neutrino too. Why? Because they came out back to back. So now I got half of it. So now the next thing that I want to do here is that I now need to get the energy of the muon. So Next, we get the muon energy. So the way I get the muon energy is that I could plug this in to the E squared term. So there's a, so what I should say here is that there's two ways 
to do this. You could go and do this. I got the momentum, so I should be able to do that. Very messy. If you like algebra, do it that way. If you're a thinking person, what we could use is that we could use the conservation of energy term. Why? Because it turns out that this will be much easier to actually deal with the algebra. And let me show you what I mean by that. So if I do it the second way, so if I use conservation of energy, what you'll see here is that I now have E pi minus E of this guy here, but then check this out. This guy is the same as what? Well, we know that this guy is only the rest energy of the pion, and then we know that the energy of uh, the neutrino is the same as the kinetic energy of the muon. So I can also write this here because that's what we wrote up here. Remember when we wrote up here, we said that, hey, these energies are the same. And because the energies are the same, I now have this. So now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take this square term, I'm gonna plug it right into here. So if I look at this, then I'm going to get pi c squared, and then I'm going to put in this term here. So let me write it in here. So I'm going to get what? m pi squared minus m u squared divided by 2 pi, 2 m pi times c squared. So what I can do then is that, check this out. If I look at this term, note that there's not a common denominator here, but if you get a common denominator, then what I'm really gonna do here is that I'm gonna do what? I'm gonna come in here and look at that denominator right there. If I come over here, I'm gonna move my, my equal sign. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna write this by two m pi, two m pi. And now I now have a common denominator and if I do that, look what I'm going to get. I'm going to get 2n squared c squared. And then in here, I got a minus m pi squared. So if you do that, then look what's going to happen. In the end, if you after the dust settles, you're going to get m pi squared. Look at the minus and the minus for the muon divided by 2m pi c squared, that gives me the energy of the muon. So just by a little bit of algebra, you get that result right there. So one more time, right? There's no magic here. Look at the first term right here. 2m pi squared, and look at this, this gives me minus m pi squared. So two minus one is one, which gives me m pi squared. And then I got a minus and a minus, that becomes a plus, which gives me m mu squared. And there's my energy. So if that's the case here, then I could now go calculate the speed. So the speed of the muon is then going to be what? It's going to be this times the kinetic energy divided by the energy of the muon. So if I put this in, here I go. The first term was m pi squared minus m mu squared divided by 2 Actually, let me put c squared divided by 2 m pi. The second term here has a plus in between. So then I'm going to get m pi squared plus 
m mu squared, c squared times 2 m pi, and you could see that I'm going to get cancellations. You could see that the c's cancel. You could see that the mass terms cancel. So then the last thing that I have then is going to be m pi squared minus m u squared over m pi squared plus m mu squared. And this is beta here, but let's put in our numbers here. Our numbers are that the mass of the muon, uh, of the pion, excuse me, is 140 MeV. The mass of the muon is 106 MeV. And then it's going to be 140 squared plus 106 squared. And so when you compute that number at the end, I get what? 0 0.27 for beta. Now, is this a surprise? No idea. No. And the reason why is that we expected a non-relativistic muon. So I'm going to go up for a brief moment. And I'm going to grab this thing. And I want to grab this picture right here. And I want to come back down. It's not a surprise because look what we did when we looked at our energy, rest energies. We said that we expected the momentum of the muon to be small because most of the phase space was taken up by the mass of the muon. So it's, it's agreeing with the physics that we were dealing with earlier. Okay, let's move on. Any questions before I move on? Okay, we want to talk about mass, energy, conversion, and what does it mean to be binding energy? Now, I don't know, I, I, I know that not all of you have had 4B. The best thing to really have in this section of this course is, is understanding what does potential energy mean? And there's, when you get to this level, potential energy is very different than what is typically discussed in a class. And so I'm hoping to give you some sense of what that means here. So when I think about an application of energy and mass, well, mass energy, did you, did you realize that I didn't say mass? I said mass energy. And that's a very, very important distinction because, you know, you can have people like me who've been doing this shit for 45 years. And when I say mass, I don't mean like mass by itself. I mean mass energy. But textbooks and online, people get very, very slippery with words. So I'm going to try to use mass energy in this section explicitly because I want you to realize that once energy gets put into a system, they'll say, oh, the mass of this particle increased. That is a bunch of bullshit. Because didn't I already say that mass is an invariant for all observers? And if it's an invariant for all observers, how can mass increase? But people are slippery when they use their words. So in this section, I'm going to be really careful. And I'm going to try to say mass energy every single time. 
because once you take energy and you put it into the system, I can't differentiate kinetic energy from potential energy, from mass energy, from electrical, whatever you want to think about. It's in a big cauldron. And I can't, you know, take my ladle and just go, oh yeah, I'm going to only pull out this amount. It's all mixed in. So we got to be really, really careful. The language here is really bad. Once again, think about what I'm saying. It's very common for people to say, oh, the mass of the system increased. But that causes a dilemma right away. If mass is a Lorentz invariant, how did mass increase? And the question is, it didn't. But the mass energy of the system, which I can't separate, does increase. And this is where the four energy becomes really important. So the mass energy. But then, uh, um, um, how do you um, tell part, like, say that you have um, some compound and you have to use like more, like amount of, like, um, uh, potential or I mean, like, is but that I think I think we can't really talk about that right now because the question that you're talking about is binding energy, and I bet you when I talk about binding energy, it's going to be quite different than what you talk about binding energy. By the way, what I'm going to show you right now is truly the only way to describe what binding energy is. And you may have talked about it in your other classes, but I suspect that in, when you, as soon as you move into the world of relativity, it becomes a problem. And that's why I'm saying, Let's, but let's hold off that question until I get to relative, till we get to binding energy. So mass energy predicted by relativity is this so-called rest energy. And note, what did I say? Meaning less, right? Meaning less. So when we talk about energy, we got to talk about the whole single particle definition of energy. So I agree that rest energy talks about the momentum and the mass energy, but you can't separate the two. And so what you're going to find here so if mass, as they say, is truly energy, we must be able to transform it into other forms of energy, right? The classic definition of energy is that you have to be able to transform it into different types of energy here. So classical physics does not have mass energy. There's no such thing as mass energy in classical physics. Mass energy was literally connected to energy as soon as Einstein wrote the details of special relativity. It wasn't, it didn't exist till Einstein did it. And so what you find here is that classical physics does not have that but they had 
conservation of mass. And in class of classical physics, conservation of mass was a very, very strong conservation law. Very, very, very strong. However, in special relativity, it's violated. And the reason why it's violated is because I can convert mass energy into different things. That means mass can disappear and reappear as other things. And that's the beauty of this thing here. So mass is not a conserved quantity in nature, but total energy is, okay? So mass can disappear and yeah, no problem. But if you mass disappears, energy has to show up. So what we need to do here is that typically when we talk about energy disappearing or being created, what you find here is that we have to look at a system. And so here's my key point. The key point here is this, if one interprets um, the rest mass energy of a system it's easiest to consider an annihilation process. And what I mean by an annihilation process, that means I'm, I have to have matter and antimatter. So let's go through the process here. So you could imagine here that I have two particles that are being shot at each other. So let's say one's red, one's blue. So as I shoot them at each other, what we're seeing here, one is a matter particle, the other one is antimatter. And from what we talked about before, if they have truly opposite quantum numbers, remember what I said about quantum numbers, they are the characteristics of a particle. If all of the quantum numbers disappear, there is no particle, it's gone. So what you end up with is pure energy. So in this case here, this might be our before situation. And what we're saying here is that after the collision here, what we can get here is we get this, this energy. And what you're seeing here as I have my system that goes from here to there. What you're seeing here is then this whole process, what you're getting here is that if mass disappears, energy must be released. There's no way around it. That's what happens in the annihilation process. Mass disappeared, so it's, it's that way. Now, one of the things that we've talked about in the past, though, is that because of the rest energy, right? Maybe I should call this pure energy right in here. So now I have pure energy. And one of the things that we said here is that if we took our antimatter watches and our regular watch and we threw them at each other, we could get the Bing, Big Ben clock to come out of that because of the four energy expression. And what you find here is that afterwards, we can create particles here. So when I think about these particles here, 
I'm creating new matter here. So, right, we create new massive um, particles after annihilation. And so what you're seeing here is that this is my after picture. And then there's another flow chart. If you look at this flow chart, this flow chart goes from here to there. And when you're looking at this flow chart, it's a different process that actually occurs here. And in this process here, we say here, it takes, um, energy to make mass and that's what the energy the mass energy relationship tells me 